What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Falcons Final Whistle. I'm Scott Baer. With me, Tori McElhaney and Ashton Edmonds. We're coming to you after a week seven result that did not go the Falcons way. Uh, the Bengals beat them soundly 35 to 17 at Paycor Stadium in Cincinnati. Uh, all three of us are back home in the ATL. We're going to try to make sense of not only what happened in this game, but where the Falcons go from here, how they can improve, and the state of affairs in the NFC South, which, uh, spoiler alert, uh, <laughs> it's pretty up for grabs right now. Um, shockingly so, after Carolina beat Tampa Bay, and the Falcons and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are still sitting atop the, the division at three and four. So first of all, uh, let's focus on this game first before we go big picture, y'all. Um, Ashton, your initial impressions on this game overall. It wasn't a game that went well for Atlanta. Um, right. where, where, where do you think that it went wrong? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing was a lot of players were hurt. Um, I think that's what hurt the Falcons the most. Um, early in the game, I mean, Tyler Boyd, he scored a touchdown with two minutes into the game. The game just started. Um, but like the, the the secondary was beat up, and I think Joe Burrow just capitalized on knowing that. I think um, you know they they knew that the Falcons had a lot of injured players, and you know especially on defense. And I just think they capitalized on that and and just you know kind of made the most of that situation. And you know they had all, all three of their wide receivers were healthy, so I think it was just easy to find those open pockets and and you know capitalize. Like I said. Tori, what were your takeaways from this one? Um, I had a lot of takeaways, but none as big as this is the first game that the Falcons have played that I don't want to take anything from. Um, and I say that because the first six games of the season, I felt like even in losses, there was something kind of a redeeming quality of which you could take from it and something that you knew you could build off of. This this loss to me was the first time that I felt like I would like to leave the loss where it was. And after I do my notebook tomorrow, like not even look at it again, because I think that the Falcons are better than what they put on the field on Sunday against the Bengals. Um, I I completely agree with what Ashton was saying, where I think the the Bengals played the game that they wanted to play. I never felt like the Falcons were dictating the game. I always felt like the game was in Cincinnati's hands to, to change and to dictate. And for that and that alone, it's that, that to me was my biggest takeaway on top of, of course, the statistical day that the Bengals had in comparison to what it was for the Falcons. I mean, I'm sure we'll get into all of that later, but just that was my overarching feelings as we kind of headed back to Atlanta. Yeah, I mean, I I understand what you're saying. Uh, Jake Matthews was saying, I spoke to him in the postgame locker room, and he said that the one thing that we can't do is not learn from this. Pardon the double negative, yeah. but we have to correct everything and not let those mistakes happen again. But so I can understand what he's saying, okay? I can also understand what you're saying, and I don't think that they're completely disparate, right? I think when it comes down to it is that there were – errors of execution, right? And then now we can bring Ashton's opinion into this thing that they were super beat up in the secondary. And that fact was compounded by AJ Terrell leaving in the first quarter with a hamstring injury and being ruled out of that game. Um, their secondary was decimated and it seemed like the Bengals didn't even really feel like running very much. Um, and, they, <laughs> and, and they saw a weakness they exposed it, right? Well, then, since we're on this topic right now, okay, have the Bengals created some game tape that other opponents can use? Or do you think that this is a situation of Cincinnati knew what it had, Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, Tyler Boyd, and uh, T. Higgins, and against a beat-up secondary? Is this an individual matchup situation, or are there things – positive or negative that can be extrapolated about the Falcons and how they defend. Like, do you understand my question? Like, is there like, yeah, was it this matchup or is it something grander at play here? I, I think it's honestly probably a little bit of both. I think that we have seen moments where the Falcons defense has struggled to stop 
um, an offense that kind of looks like how the Bengals operate. I think about the Rams. I think about the Tampa Bay game and how these quarterbacks have been able to take advantage of the Falcons secondary at moments. Now, is this a formula that other teams can replicate down the road? It, and I believe that's kind of what you're asking. It's like, right. honestly, it, it kind of does. That is the one thing that does worry me moving forward because it's now we've seen games a a few games where the Falcons secondary and the pass rush not getting there and they're kind of this problem extrapolating a circumstance and and so it's not just defense too I know I'm harping on defense a lot because of the statistics that was Joe Burrow and those three receivers for the Bengals but it was an offensive problem too when the run is not working the Falcons struggle to move the ball and when they are in obvious passing situations they struggle to move the ball and to move the chains because of that I think there is almost this formulaic type of look at the Falcons where it's like if you put them in passing situations and then also if you as an offense are passing the ball is that a recipe for success against the Falcons I think that is a much bigger question that I'm not sure I can answer fully yet, but there have been moments where it has felt like that over the course of the first seven weeks of the season. Yeah. And just kind of, as you were talking, I was briefly thinking back about the quarterbacks that I've seen face the Falcons this year. And Joe Burrow was the best, better than a 45 year old Tom Brady at that, on, at that particular week, better than Matthew Stafford back right. in week two. Um, no offense to Geno Smith and his, uh, <laughs> comeback player of the year uh, run right now but Ashton looking at what Joe Burrow was able to do we, we uh, you and I talked a lot during the week kind of away from things that record um, just about how <laughs> how the Bengals kind of take advantage of those passes within t- zero to nine yards in the air and turn it into 15 20 yard plays sure. um, what did you think about kind of Joe Burrow's operation and do you need an elite quarterback to kind of execute this, the, th- this strategy like that we're talking about? Yeah. And no, I think Joe Burrow did a great job in the air today. I think um, he found the Falcons weak spots on defense. As soon as Cornell Armstrong came in the game, I mean, he started targeting Jamar, Jamar Chase, you know, I think maybe like two or three times back to back. And he's an experienced quarterback. You know, he played in the Super Bowl last year. He's, he's relatively young, but, he still has that NFL experience and he can read defenses and know who to throw it to, when to throw it to him. And, you know, he knew AJ Terrell was, was banged up. He knew Casey Hay- Hayward wasn't in. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, his coaches and the players studied um, the secondary and, and knew that we had a lot of young players in the secondary, you know, Richie Grant, Jalen Hawkins, like these are relatively young guys. So um, I think Joe Burrow knew the weapons that he has in, in the trio with Tyler Boyd, um, T Higgins and, um, Jamar Chase and you know he he utilized his weapons and um, you know I think he like I said I think he found um, he found all the weak spots in the Falcons secondary and just you know capitalized from there. Yeah I, I think AJ Terrell's status is going to be something to monitor closely as we move forward here with Casey Hayward who um, and I guess you can come at me in the comments, but who I think has been or was the best Falcons cornerback, not the most talented, but the best, most consistent Falcons cornerback through the first six weeks with, with him being on injured reserve and even a rookie like D Alford, who's good in space and good making plays on the ball, him being unavailable. And then AJ Terrell going out and being ruled out quickly. That's generally yeah. not a great sign, but that secondary, which was a strength and had a lot of depth is just in a different place right now. I think Darren Hall has some talent. Cornell Armstrong was kind of thrown to the wolves talking to him afterward. He said he wouldn't have given up the opportunity no matter who he was playing. Um, and he wants to do better next week. Isaiah Oliver just came back. They just got the secondary together um, only to see injury kind of fall apart there. Um, you know, I, I just think that that was definitely difficult and kind of going back to everything that we're saying here is it was coaching for the Bengals, understanding the state of the secondary, where it was at, how much it got worse with AJ out and an elite level quarterback with 
elite level targets taking advantage of their strengths. Um, and ultimately it came down to it. It's not like this game was without fight for the Falcons. Um, the second quarter flurry there with a 16 play drive, that was a touchdown and then a 75 yard strike to Demir bird followed by the amazing Avery Williams punt return to set up young way Koo's field goal, uh, which also gets to a point I'm not kind of abandoning the script, Tori. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. But, no, but, you're good. But I'm going to let you kind of take it from there because you asked Arthur Smith a question. And we talk about all these explosive plays and all these stats and all these big name players doing big name things. There was a part in this game that you brought up to Arthur Smith that I think is really important because it's boring and you could overlook it in a box score. But there was a pivotal series in this game that really changed it more than anything else. Um which series and which uh, kind of sequence were you talking about there with coach? Yeah. So it was the opening three drives of the third quarter. And you look at where the Falcons were, they were down 28, 17. They had just, you know, you, you talk about Avery Williams setting up young way field goal. They had got it within 28, 17. You go into halftime, you kind of feel the momentum, you know, you get the ball coming out after halftime and then you get the ball and you go three and out Tyler Algier runs the ball for one yard two incompletions punt then and so that in and of itself that three and out is not what you want but then it was also Cincinnati gets the ball on their own 42 yard line and the defense comes up with a with a stop they you have Rashawn Evans who um, allowed like no gain on second down. And then you had Cornell Armstrong with a pass breakup on third down. And so Cincinnati gives the ball back to uh, the, the Falcons. They, it was a turnover on downs, I'm pretty sure, on, on fourth down, if I'm remembering yeah. correctly. And then, so Atlanta gets the ball back. So now you're like, okay, well, the, that first drive of the third quarter, it didn't go as you want it to, but then they get the ball back and they don't do anything with it. Not only do they not do anything with it, Tyler Algier is dropped for three on first down. Mariota is sacked for a loss of one on second down. And then you're, I mean, you're looking at third and very long and it's a situation where you had two good chances offensively to do something with a defensive stop in sandwich between those two, three and outs. That to me was a moment that was the most discouraging. I know we could talk a lot about the yards that were garnered throughout the whole entire four quarters, but that probably, let's say five minute swing was really tough for me to move past because I felt as though the Falcons scored touchdown in that opening drive. I mean, you're looking at a diff, you're, you're looking at a one score game a, a little ways through the third quarter that completely changes how you feel moving forward. It gives you a little bit of momentum. It puts you back into the game because then after that, it just kind of went, I mean, Cincinnati went and scored um, on their second drive of the third quarter. So it it really, to me, that moment, that five minute period was kind of what sealed the deal for the Falcons in this game. Um, If I'm reading this correctly, um, in the second half, I hope I'm reading this correctly, had the Falcons had drives of net yards, net yards of one yard gained, seven yards gained, and nine yards gained over the course of the third quarter where the Bengals have been really good this season. Um, in the fourth quarter, again, if I'm reading this right, uh, it looks like they only had 23 net yards in the fourth quarter. And that's, that's where we're going to shift a little bit to the offense here. Um, and I just wanted to bring up a couple of numbers. Number one, um, the, the Falcons ran 45 offensive plays to Cincinnati 66 average gain at 4.8 yards. Um, and here's the interesting thing, right? That I've mentioned, I feel like we all have kind of talked about this, that there might be a time where the Falcons are going to have to go get a win or press to get a win by throwing 35 times, right. By really trying to work the ball through the air to try to make it up. And you look at the play disparity here and we're talking about 29 runs. They ran more than the Bengals um, for the same per carry average. And um, I only see now there could be penalties that have would have eliminated dropbacks, but there were only 13 attempts 
Um, so even when they're behind multiple scores, the Falcons still aren't passing. I want to make this very, very clear before we go forward. This is not a question of, we are not questioning play calling. That's not what's happening here. I don't do that. We don't do that on this podcast. It's dumb. Okay. What, what I think that we're doing is try to extrapolate truths about this team. Right. And that's where I want people to focus and understand what we're talking about here. We're not saying should have called the pass when you call the run, Arthur, that ain't it. Okay. Right. That's base level rhetoric that doesn't have any place here. Diatribe over um, this, this type of play disparity. I think it does speak to what the Falcons do. Well, they, they run the ball well, but they have not found that type of consistent passing rhythm without the benefit of a play action pass or a big strike or something like that. Um, this team is not, you know, kind of balanced in that same way right now. I mean, that's just the way that it is. Yeah. It's funny too, because I feel like we've been saying this about the Falcons, but in like the opposite conversation, like with Matt Ryan in the pocket, it was always a conversation of, Oh, they're not balanced because they can't run the ball. Like they're not running the ball as an offense. I feel like for the last, I don't even know how many years that has been the problem is it with, when you're talking about the balance of the offense. Now it's kind of flipped on its head and it's kind of, Com- the other side of the coin where it's like the Falcons can run the ball and, and do find success doing that. But again, going back to what I was saying early, when, earlier, when they are in obvious passing downs, it's, it, it feels like it's either hit Alameda Zacchaeus or bust, you know, like that's kind of what it feels like. I, I, but I, I think when you look at this offense, it is something that they have to clean up because we go back to now there's a formula for how to defend this team when you look at it, how much can this offense kind of take the more film that is put on other teams' radars? Uh, Because the Falcons are at their best when they do have a bit of mystery in what they're doing offensively. Can we say that they were still mysterious, you know, getting into the third and fourth quarter of of this game? And I, I mean, and then it even goes back to, the Rams game in week two, this scene, this start, this has started to feel like a similar topic of conversation over the course of seven games is like the Falcons are having trouble in those obvious passing downs. Yeah. And I mean, but other side of it is if you go back to the Browns game, right, they were in trouble and they weren't passing the ball well, and they barely threw the ball at all. And then they decided to, you know, to run the, run the ball a lot shall we say I'm not going to repeat I will say I will say too with with that like it I felt like the day the game was different like the in this game in this game you're fighting from behind at one point you're down by what 18 and you're still running the ball like that is it's not wild to me because I can understand doing it because it was it was what was working for you and it's kind of your roots as an offense but it does make me wonder like what's the confidence level in being able to throw the ball and when, you know, that was something that not to like compare apples to oranges, but when you talk about what the, uh, what this offense was last year, it could go out and get big chunks of yards, throwing the ball downfield. Now, can we say the same thing here? Yes. I mean, you can, because Marcus Mariota connected for Demir or bird, a 75 yard touchdown, but it's like doing it consistently that's the difference. It's like one play is great, but can you do it through four quarters? Right. And I mean, if, if you're throwing in completions on first and second and 10 and setting up third and longs, that's not good either. But I, I, I do think that if the Falcons are playing their game, if they set the tone and can dictate tempo and create turnovers, something that they didn't do yes. um, against the Bengals, then you create situations and recipes that are ripe for victory And I don't think that it's outlandish to say that that is a winning formula for them. They need, but they can't get in these types of situations against, I mean, I, Joe Burrow's elite level quarterback, right? I I was searching for my adjective there, but nonetheless, um, I do think that the, that the Falcons have a winning formula. Um, I think that I'm sure other teams probably think that they have a beatable formula, but do you have mm-hmm. Joe Burrow? Is PJ Walker Joe Burrow? Is right. Andy yeah. Dalton or that's, James Winston that's Joe the Burrow? Question. Yeah. Right. Is, is can't because even the Rams, who I think had a similar 
um, concept, even Matt Stafford couldn't execute at the level that was required to put that game away. So I will also say, though, I do think the trio of receivers that the Bengals have very different than what Matthew Stafford has with the Rams. I I do think that this was honestly a recipe for uh, trouble. It was, it was, yeah, it was going to be, it was going to be really tough for the Falcons. Like going in, you knew that this matchup like wasn't one that really like turned in the Falcons favor at all. And the Bengals are hot, you know, they're hot. This this is Cornell Armstrong's first, like very first game of the season, right? Yeah. Practice squad elevation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, like you said, he was thrown into the wolves. I think this is probably the toughest game. I mean, I think it's only going to make him better, but like him getting thrown against the Bengals, you know, I, I think that it was just like you said, a recipe for disaster. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, kind of perfect storm situation with the Falcons secondary being severely hindered by injury, plus Joe Burrow, plus the Bengals being hot, plus the three targets that are all kind of next level. Okay, I I think we've done a pretty good job deciphering what this game was um, and maybe some question marks or things to identify about, you know, how the Falcons can win, maybe how they can be beat and what needs to get fixed in order to eliminate those strategies. All that said, right, um, Arthur Smith said it in his press conference making no excuses and i think that was important that they're the they're also thankful that this only counts as one you lose 35 to 34 you lose like this still just one loss um in a wild result considering everything that carolina has been through recently tampa bay lost to carolina by multiple scores so go figure new orleans lost to arizona on thursday night We are in the middle of an NFC South race that is looking strange. Uh, Yeah. The Falcons lost a game, but didn't lose any ground in the division is really what I'm trying to get at. And I think that that's something I wrote about in my column. I think after the initial frustration of the fan base wears off from what they saw today, they will come to realize that opportunity um, still exists. And maybe that the, not only are the Buccaneers vulnerable, but maybe the Falcons can, Fix, what, fix the problems that they have, find ways to surge and scrap out and get victories and be alive in December and find some consistency, find some rhythm. That's something that they haven't found yet, something that Rashawn Evans said. Ashton, I just said all that stuff, but really kind of entering week eight here with an, yeah. with an ability to go out there, like Carolina twice, Chargers who lost today, and then yeah, this isn't an order, but Chicago, Washington, um, Pittsburgh, that that they that they have they do have an opportunity to get in rhythm and kind of establish themselves, you know, as a uh, as a contender in this division. Oh yeah, most definitely. Um, I mean, they beat a really good Browns team, a really good Seahawks team already. These are really good teams that have been winning, you know, consistently over the last few weeks. But I think going in, into Week Eight against the Panthers, the Panthers, you know, they don't have Baker Mayfield. They have a lot of young players. Their team is kind of pieced together as well. Um, they did execute against the Bucks, but I think the Falcons do have a great chance at winning um, the, this this upcoming Sunday against the Panthers to go four and four. I think this was the toughest three game stretch, um, and I think they played relatively well through it. Um, but I think this last game, you know, it it kind of hurt them. But like I said, they were hurt for the most part all around with the defense, and you know, the offense just wasn't executing. Um, and I think after they watch film this week, I think they when they see what they can clean up going into week eight against the Panthers at home, they, you know, they won two at home already. So they have that momentum. I think, um, I, I mean, I think the Falcons have a great chance at going above 500 going into week eight, honestly. Yeah, I'm really. Too- go ahead, go ahead. No, go for it, Tori. I was just going to say, like, you know, of, of the places where I feel like this team has been over the last, like, three years, the fact that they're three and four right now is not, like, the end of the world. I mean, to be completely honest, I feel like there are a lot of people that did not think that they would get to week eight at three and four. Um, I would have win against the Bengals have been fantastic. Yeah, it would have, but that didn't happen, and it showed this team what it has to work on. And, it, I mean, it's not – I think Arthur Smith has said it before, and I think I even said it like last week on the podcast where it's like being objective after a win is just as important as being objective after a loss. And 
I think the Falcons probably learned more about themselves in this loss than maybe even the win last week. And kind of, it, it kind of, cause I mean, it goes back to what we were saying about like formula for winning versus a formula for getting beat. Like what is the difference in that for the Falcons? And I, I will say like heading into this stretch of games over the course of the next probably like month, I feel like it's a good opportunity for the Falcons to, we talk about identity a lot to against some of these teams really capitalize on who they are as a team and as a, as units and, and all of those things. I, I think it's really important that they solidify that over the course of the next month, because like what you're saying, if you're getting into December and you're playing pretty hot, that's, that's the perfect time. I mean, we talk about it with, uh, Scott's a Padres fan, and so we we were talking about baseball a lot in the context of it's like all about who's hot at the end of the season. It really does feel that way, and it, I feel the I feel like there are kind of sprinklings of that in the NFL season too, especially right now where anyone can beat anyone on any given Sunday. I think that is so important. There's not a lot of um, parity in in uh in, in nfl football right now there's a lot that of just people being kind of on similar levels i mean you just saw the panthers beat the bucks and uh, i the falcons are three and four you know there are there are a lot of things across the league that i think make it interesting when we're looking at where this team goes from here yeah i mean you you bring up unexpected losses washington beat green bay today right what yeah <laughs> that makes yep. that makes zero logical sense if you were to analyze that game heading into it. Um, Taylor Heineke versus Aaron Rodgers seems like a lopsided outcome. Turned out to not be that way, and but nonetheless, that's why they play the games. That's why so many of these teams, even the Bengals, which look like an absolute juggernaut in Week Seven, are four and three. They've stumbled. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of these teams have stumbled. So uh, how like how you recover? How how you kind of bounce through it? Um, and if you can get on a couple, two, three game hot streak and go three out of four, like the Falcons just did, you can find yourself in a good position. Um, you know, and those are all things to monitor. Um, you can definitely always keep an eye on and monitor this Falcons final whistle podcast by subscribing to the Falcons podcast network. Please do it on Apple podcasts, Spotify. If you're a night owl, uh, come to our channel or just subscribe, but come to our channel around 10, 30, 11, and you, and you could be like the first one to get it. Or if you're more of a YouTube subscriber, they go up at 6 a.m. bright and early, and they're with you for the rest of the week. So thank you guys so much for engaging, interacting uh, with the podcast. Uh, we definitely appreciate everybody downloading and listening, and we'll talk to you all again next week.